Um, okay, so uh, another proper warm welcome uh, to, to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, as I said, my name is Marika, I work at Unlimited, um, and I'm really, really pleased to, to welcome back um, our webinar host, Richard Dickens. Richard is a another long-standing friend of Unlimited. He's he's done a lot of lot of work with us, a lot of lot of mentoring, workshops um, around around business business development, um, and and especially around social impact. Richard uh, is the founder of a Make It Happen consultancy, and so day in day out, really works with social entrepreneurs and social businesses, helping them helping them succeed to do better and to be able to understand and evidence, evidence their impact. Um, today the webinar will focus on um, social value, uh, calling it the comprehensive guide to social value, um, and Richard will do his best <laughs> to give you a comprehensive guide in about 45 minutes, which I know it's, uh, it's, uh, can be a bit of a challenge. Um, obviously it's a wide topic. So I will, I will let Richard start. We'll cover questions at the end. So please do ask any questions you have and you can input those through the, through the chat function um, on, the, on the webinar dashboard. We'll, we'll get those, get those covered, covered in the end. So I think that's enough from me. So yeah, Richard will speak about 45 minutes, then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish by one o'clock. That's all from me and over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're sitting down with a nice cup of tea um, and are going to enjoy the next 45 minutes. Um, I will do my best to make it um, informative and enjoyable, hopefully not too stressful. Um, and as Marika said, all slides um, and any questions uh, will be answered or produced at the end. Um, as we're completely aware that it's a challenging topic and it's a topic which is fast evolving. So the thought process and the confidence and the skills associated with that are evolving also. So yes, my name is Richard Dickens. I've been probably involved with social value now for about seven years. Um, battle hardened, but um, still positive that it's actually a, a fantastic um, thought process, a, a tool um, and a focus for the future, particularly with social enterprises and socially focused organizations to for the first time to truly demonstrate why they are different but also demonstrate why it's, it's actually um, more important than just the pounds, shillings and pence that um, when we produce services or um, produce products that a lot of people within the wider communities and the public sector do actually um, take notice of. So over the next 45 minutes we will discuss the wonderful world of social value. But first of all, what I wanted to just say is legitimacy. Now on the slide you actually see our credentials. And the reason why I put that up is actually one so you can obviously see our background. But more importantly, when you do anything around social value, you've got to be legitimate. You've got to come from a place of confidence, but a place where you can back up any claim, any story, any figure, or any assumptions that you've made. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are a lot of wild claims being made throughout the country, um, throughout organizations, and unfortunately, they're not in a position to back it up. So it's demonstrating why you're legitimate within your role, or why you're legitimate within your organization and how value is being created as a result of that legitimacy. How many organizations do you know, for example, who are developing products and services with no history of doing so within that field? It's happening more and more. So organizations such as yourselves, small, medium, or large, it doesn't actually matter. If you've got a background, a passion and the enthusiasm, it's demonstrating how and why that makes you credible and legitimate to actually um, create value, maximize your value, and then use that to create strong partnerships in the future. So we've got a range of current influences. I'm not going to make a big thing about this because the majority of you are going to know about the Social Values Act. The majority of you know about the Localism Act, both of which are causing 
challenges within the public sector at the moment. However, people do forget that the Localism Act can be a friend to smaller organisations, particularly those who are socially minded. The reason why I say that is, with the Social um, Values Act, it looks at social, environmental and economic. What it doesn't tend to kind of focus on is the local aspects of each of those. What's the point, for example, of actually creating value up in Scotland if you're based in Portsmouth? It's great for currently the UK economy, that may change. However, people want to know what's affecting them locally. So everything you do around value needs to be demonstrating geographically and demographically who you're affecting. So the localism act is extremely important. Also because there's a range of um, uh, aspects of the, the Localism Act which empowers local communities to take charge, right to bid, right to challenge, etc, etc. So it's worth looking at. We've also got to consider that um, communities are changing. We've also got to consider that individuals are changing and wanting more. So ethical consumerism as it stands today, people are making different choices about where they shop, who they support and how they support. Two out of five purchases in the UK today are based on personal beliefs. That's increasing exponentially almost um, over the last couple of years and it's touching on three to three and a half they reckon over the next 18 months. So how do you demonstrate that you are local, you are um, values driven, you are ethical, transparent and legitimate? It goes part of your branding, but it also goes obviously in what you're doing in terms of service provision. So understanding that whatever you create has to consider these aspects, then you can start to attract a strong, robust relationship with individuals. Otherwise, whatever you produce will not be trusted, and it will waste all your good time. So in many ways, there's no point starting unless you look at that. Everyone has value for money. That's always going to be there. Never going to go away, and we have to accept that. And added value is very much intrinsically linked to to value for money, also. So it's demonstrating what you do above and beyond. Very easy when you're socially passionate and motivated to blend everything together, and then you can't see what you should be doing to what you want to do or what you need to do. And by having that confusion, very hard then to run your business and demonstrate the added value of your services. So think about value. So value is um, something which means different things to different people. It can be financial, it can be non-financial. It can be a sense of belonging, a sense of belief. So what we can't have is a single model in many ways to look at everything because one model doesn't exist. Different people, as I said, relate to value in a different way. So public sector relate to value financially. Funders are starting to think that way, but they're still very much in that emotional, physical and psychological change. That's what value means to them. When it comes to fundraising, what we're looking at is actually in a local context. We want people to be affected locally and also that emotional value. So when you blend that in, what you've got is an organization which creates invest. That's not a dirty word because it's profit for social value. Underpinned by your own personal values and ethics involving people within the community to make this impact. And only social impact goes on to create social value. It's not the same thing. It's completely different. So if you look at terminology, as you can see by the number of different headings here, what we've got is areas which almost take you through a process. The majority of people in the UK today are still in and around the social outcomes. So what has changed as a result of your service? What are the benefit of the activities have on stakeholders? But it's like today, you may gain a lot of information on social value. Great, that's an outcome. But unless you actually do something with that information, then it has no value. It's like if you're feeling happier, that's fantastic. 
but if your happiness doesn't involve you doing things differently or thinking differently or acting differently, again, it has no value. So what we need to do is move the conversation down. And moving the conversation down to people who then can understand it and come on your journey. So outcomes is where we are now. Moving into impact. Impact is all around what is being done differently as a result of outcomes being achieved. Now, it's quite a simple thing because you just ask that question to your stakeholders. What's been done differently as a result of engaging with our service, our organization, with an individual? And then only then, once you understand the difference, you can ask or find out or research the value that individuals placed. So is it a financial cost saving? Is it a financial or sorry, non-financial resource saving? Has it been a personal change in that individual and they now value things differently? And only then, once value has been created, does it have longevity, or hopefully longevity, therefore the legacy, which creates worth. And that's how we're moving on within the social value journey. And people often forget about the word social accounting. Social accounting is purely the process of achieving or measuring or accounting for value, impact, outcomes, um, outputs. It has nothing else, it's purely a process. Number one failure today in accounting for value is following the process but not having the techniques and the confidence to be able to make relevant assumptions, relevant um, research techniques, relevant um, demonstrations of transparency. So you, you understand it but it becomes very hard when you come to the implement it. So what we need, in, to, need to do is start breaking down what value means. Because you don't have to measure everything all at once. The best thing to do is actually find out what your stakeholders value and then only measure what they value, which we come on to in a bit. So if we can see on the slide in front of you now, there are different aspects. One of the most important ones you, you'll see there is the local investment and development. There are very, very simple, quick wins that can be achieved understanding what value you have locally. And they come right at the end of the slides today. Sometimes, actually, uh, people will challenge the financial benefit that you may create, i.e. a cost saving, i.e. that if you help improve health and well-being, there will be less trips to the doctor. That is quite possible. And as a result of that GP appointment not being needed is a £43 saving. Again, quite possible. But people can challenge because that doctor will still be there. However, if you say that we can predict or we can evaluate that the reduction of an appointment would mean 11.7 .7 minutes saved for that GP, you can't argue so much against that. So time becomes more important. Capacity becomes more important. So that doctor could see someone else. So it's then breaking it down just to understand what's important to you. The partnership aspect, really want to pull out, is majority of organizations today will work in collaborative relationships, whether formal or informal. The value created through a partnership can exceed 40% of all the value created by an organization. So it's really paramount you understand the effects that you have on them and vice versa. Maybe efficiency, effectiveness, it may be the referrals. Would they have referrals without your organization or vice versa? Would they be known to uh, relevant support agencies if it wasn't for your organization? Do you help engage and encourage people who are hard to reach enter into the system? All to do with partnership value. So you just need to consider which elements are important to you. And then consider how it's created. So the flowchart in front of you is quite simple. In as much as you will create value as an organization across the core aspects of a community. So as you see on this slide, 
you will have value within health, employment, housing, economy, social and community, education and skills, environmental and justice. The chances are you will have value in more than one, probably two thirds and possibly all. So take a homeless, homelessness support organisation, you may uh, encourage or provide um, temporary accommodation. Great, that's housing. But as a direct result of that, you improve health and well-being, which may actually then help with housing and health to enable that person or encourage that person to seek volunteering opportunities or start to look at employment. So you have employment value, which then in turn has an effect on the economy. And once you gain employment, you then have new skills and knowledge and confidence being created. So you can see that just because you may be in the health arena or housing arena, you have a broader depth of value. You can choose where to start and where to finish. So you may only look at health this year or the next six months. Then you may look at education. Then you may look at employment. It's really important to look at that. And then always remember there's a financial and non-financial aspect to it. So biggest thing that we need to do to, to ensure that you are legitimate, transparent and people trust is look at the social contract. Now effectively it's how you engage with people and how by result of that engagement there is a trust. So people want to be involved. People don't want to be told they want to be engaged. And you know this is part of the social value uh, work and the social um, focus that you have. So what we need to do is consider each of these different areas to develop the trust and develop the engagement to get that transparent information. So by having effective communication, so engaging with them from day one, your wider stakeholders and your broader and hidden stakeholders, they're involved in your value research or evaluation or forecast. They're involved with the types of decision making that's needed. That will start to develop trust in what you say and what you do. That trust will help you in many different ways, including partnership working, uh, future engagement and income generation. That breeds legitimacy, that enables sustained social action, which generates this bond. And all a social contract is, is a strength of relationship between you and an organization or you as an individual. So what we need to do is, first of all, is look about your stakeholders. So stakeholders, anybody who's got an involvement or investment in something. So anybody who's effectively um, affected by your organization. If we consider that all of the people who engage with you will have a different reason to do so and a different value for doing so. So if we create a piece of work which demonstrates your value, that's, a, that's all well and good, but if you're a public sector, you're going to value different information. So we've got to understand what people value, what they're looking for, what they want to achieve. So you can do this by mapping who your stakeholders are through the wider, What we can do is start to streamline the amount of work you need to do. So you have to, in my opinion, and the opinion of just for everybody, is engage with your direct stakeholders. They are primary. So those can be staff, volunteers, service users, and your direct funders. They're the ones who, dare I say it, make it happen. It's your indirect ones, the people who are affected as a result of the work you do. So almost like a secondary effect, friends and family, other supporters, other organisations. And then you've got that wider. And the wider could be the community, that could be a particular demographic, that could be other services within the council. So if you work in drug and alcohol, for example, actually by definition you will have an effect on somebody within the, the crime and justice department and area the police crime commissioner. So there's a wider context and wider benefit. 
What I would suggest is you focus on the direct and indirect only initially to develop your confidence, reduce the amount of work. To make it legitimate, well, actually, it's then prioritizing the stakeholders into the power, urgency, and legitimacy. So what we say is, it's 80% of all your stakeholder groups that you would ideally need to engage with. So a group could be a group of service users, it could be your staff, volunteers. Then a minimum of 20% of your individual stakeholders in the group. So 20% of all your service users, 20% of all your staff, as a minimum. That will give you a really good control group. That will ensure that it stacks up with an academia feel, but also has that really robust um, nature about it. And then you ask key questions. Simple. Do your stakeholders trust you? Because you've got to have that. Because if they don't trust you, they won't believe you. But then you actually ask these four key questions after you know who, obviously, to engage with. What do you value? What's important? How and why? From this, you can then only um, carry out the research to value what's important to your service users or to your key direct stakeholders. What you're going for is trying to measure everything to only measuring what's important. Quite simple, really. Not hard, but it's very easy to get carried away to measure everything. Now, small organizations, time's precious. Resources are precious. So you've got to find something more simple. So going out, asking those questions. You'll have regular engagement with people to be able to do that. Then what we need to be able to do is map what is coming back. So placing it into themes. And those themes will enable you to create a range of social pledges. But these themes will directly link into financial value. So if people are coming back to say, actually, it's really important for me to develop confidence and uh, my own well-being, but also supporting people in the local community, that's what you need to be able to demonstrate to create trading activity or trading income. If, if you speak to your public sector department commissioners, they're going to say, well, actually, it's all about reducing dependency on resource. Looking at how do we have value for money and obviously making sure it's local. So as you can see here, the information you start to get back has an opportunity and a very clear message to be able to demonstrate your value and generate income from it. That's one of the ways where we've been successful in creating the 161 million, effectively by demonstrating the value to stakeholders. So once you know what your stakeholders value, you can then convert them into pledges. So these are pledges. Ideas, actually, essentially they can be outcomes Pledges are very much of, we pledge to improve the lives of local residents to something like that. So it's quite a kind of a generic statement. But you'd be able to create these um, social pledges based on the top three values from the individual stakeholders. But I'll show you in a minute how that works. So by pulling that down, placing them to the thematic areas, so if you want to focus on health, and obviously health, education, and embed them into a one sentence to demonstrate a key message externally, which could look like this. So as you can see, it's actually got four um, key values in this one. So it's a place to reduce the number of individuals at reach crisis point and require urgent medical care and intervention. When we created this one, this was all about, very simply, people, mental health um, um, challenges, which, without the support of this particular organization, would have needed urgent care at some stage in the future. So this enables you to have your key marketing message, your key USB, if you want to put that. But more importantly, this is what you measure, nothing else, your social pledge. You can have a range of eight, linking into the themes I mentioned before. Makes it clearer, makes it easier. 
then for every social pledge, you create something called a key value indicator. So a social pledge is very hard to measure. A key value indicator sits alongside what you would normally consider to be a KPI. So the KPIs are going to be your business performance, your quality, your financial reporting and compliance. Every business in the world does KPIs in some mm -hmm. shape or format, formalized or not. As a socially minded organization, regardless of what legal structure, a KVI would look very much about the social context of what you do. So it's putting that heart wrapped around the KPI which you consider is a head. Okay? So by having a KVI, what we manage to be able to do is put it into a measurable thing. So KVI would be, for example, we will reduce by 15% the number of people who need um, urgent medical care within Kent, for example. You can measure your performance against that, but also demonstrate your very clear commitment prior to measuring to your stakeholders. So we've got an here, reduced by 7.1% individuals who need to engage with preventive-based communities health and advice that otherwise would require urgent care. So, but also a very clear way of measuring, because you can measure your success of reaching those figures, and your stakeholders, particularly public sector and funders, will start to see what you are doing. So they expect you to comply with all your procedures, your policy, your, your regulators, but the social context never been measured in this way. So what we then got is once we define clearly the KVIs which you're going to commit to as an organization or you're researching, we need to then and only then look at the ways of measuring. Now there are 120 different ways to measure value, impact, outcomes in the country today and it's changing all the time. There is no one model to achieve everything. What the core things to consider is four-fifths of people who are starting at the moment are not completed within one year. The reason for that is they try to measure too much. Or they have the process knowledge of what to do but don't have the technical ability to follow it through. Therefore, creating your pledges, creating your KVIs to reduce the amount of stuff you're trying to measure will make it easier for you. Now, what we have very clearly is a range of models which can help you. Again, what I'll say is consider what your stakeholders have said to you. So Anybody who currently engages with or is a public sector organization, finance is always going to be paramount. The financial value social return on investment is one of the better models to achieve that and it is being championed by central government um, because of the um, ability, if done right and legitimately, to truly define the amount of investment that you would have returned as a result of the, in, um, the income you received, i.e. if I give you a pound of income today, how much would that pound generate in value, i.e. through preventative services, people not going to the GP, not needing urgent medical care, not going into prison. Social return investment can do that. It can also look at, if done in the right way, the resource value. So if we know you don't need an hour's worth of housing advice from the housing officer in the local authority. Actually, how long would you expect that advice to last? Is it an hour's appointment? Is it two, three, four appointments needed? If you know that, what you can do is start to measure your time saving. And as I said before, that's equally, if not more importantly, um, to a lot of people. LM3 is actually a simple overlook tool and 
actually, to be fair, we're on about LM7 now, but LM3 will start to define locally what you can and cannot achieve, what you have achieved locally, and how that is being spread. And then the simple ones are outcome stars. Um, Triangle Consultant actually created these, and it's actually a very, very good tool simply to measure the journey of change. So visually, using a star formation, 1 to 10 on each of the star pinnacles or star points, and you ask the person how they feel, how they acted, etc., at point of engagement, and it may be a 1. After they've led you, left your service, it may be a 9. So you can see a positive change. The trust element, well, we kind of touched upon that because that's the social value. Um, so social um, contract. And the engagement side, it, there isn't much, but one where um, corporates are, are using is AA1000. And that's truly more to do with um, how to engage with people and involve with them in decision making. So it's what you do and take for granted as a social minded organisation. But it's not worth mentioning. Okay, so if we want outcomes and out outputs now, so outputs are purely what are you providing? Are you providing five training sessions at eight people per session over a course of a year on health and safety? That's an output. Nothing more, nothing less. It means you're doing something, it's an activity. Where you are now would be those outcomes. What's changed? The person's happy and more confident, has a skill. That does not have the value. What we need to be able to move towards is how do we know that outcomes actually different what is being done differently. So indicators actually form part of that glue. What I will do and commit to is actually sending some examples of this journey out to you. And it's used or mentioned in many different languages theory of change, impact mapping, all those different ways. All you need to see as is the individual aspects. What do you do? What's changed? How do you know it's changed as an indicator? Under what's changing? How do you know it's changing in these core areas? So some of you will be very familiar with these, is this is basically the JSNA, Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. This is what makes up a community. Each of these areas also have a budget attached to them. So if you are being commissioned or supported by health, the good thing is, actually, you can move around and go and speak to housing for a very similar issue and get joint commission, joint funding, joint support. Because if you can demonstrate your value wider, then actually that's achievable. Then think, okay, outcomes to impact. So impact is a difference you make as a result of the change that you instigated. So that's quite simple, really. So on the screen on here, what we've got is obviously all the people as a stakeholder, which is great. Everyone says, yeah, we improve health and well-being. Non-tangible, not really measurable. By asking the questions with a stakeholder, with your service users, and say, as a result of that improved health and well-being, what is done differently? And how do you know it's been done differently? You start to get these questions come back, or these answers, hopefully, and come back. So the difference would be the reduced BMI, the um, body mass indicator or index. Because there's no point if you're just happier and feel, feel great if things are not changing. So particularly if obesity is an issue and you're working on weight, you want to see that weight reduce. Because if it does, there is a direct relationship to improve mobility and obviously cardiac fitness, particularly if you're older. So your three impacts are very clear from an outcome. Now, you can only define what you're told. So you have to ask questions which really are clear and transparent, i.e., what are you doing differently as a result of my service, Jeff, whoever it may be, 
and how do you know or how do I know that's happening, tell me. Only then when you ask them primary questions can you then probe. It's going to be an open question, almost when you do an interview with um, a new volunteer or a new member of staff. So what you can then do is actually put indicators upon that impact just to make it clearer. So okay, I've got to improve cardiac fitness, great. So my heart's a little bit stronger or a little bit more resilient. How do I know that? Well actually or how they're acting out. Well actually I'm going to the gym because you told me I'm going to the gym. You can value going to the gym by purely looking at a gym membership. You can look very clearly about actually I'm no longer so concerned about my health because I know that I'm, I'm stronger, I'm fit and more resilient. So therefore, I'm actually, I don't, I don't need to go to the, to the doctor quite so much. You know, if I've got a cold, I'm feeling stronger, I don't need to go or, or I'm less likely to go. Therefore, we can look at about the GP. And then flicking off a bit further is because I'm taking more care of my health and there's a clear benefit and a difference of doing so, I'm less likely to get to the point of crisis. Anything in health, particularly, is about not getting to crisis point. Crisis is extremely dear. And then if you move it forward in terms of how that then indicates into a value, well actually obviously GP visit, it is about the cost of a GP visit and then reducing that need going on. So if you can reduce that need and, and you can demonstrate that by not only speaking to the GP, if you're a large enough organisation or um, have a large enough impact in a, in a tight geographical area, the GP and GP practice may be aware. If not, it's for your stakeholders to tell you. So we start to think about financial and non-financial. So it's not just one model. Then we look about how long things last. People say, well, how long does it last? I say, well, how long is a piece of string? However, a quick and simple way of actually testing your, your thought process when you start to think about this is training, computer training. For people today, if, if I um, spend a day with you, like Microsoft Windows 8, how long would that training be relevant? How long would that knowledge that you've gained would be relevant. I would actually say probably three years because Windows 9 is going to be out soon. So part of that knowledge that you've gained is going to be reduced. Some of it will still remain relevant, but some of it will be lost. So within three years, you're going to need some update training or update knowledge on a new process, a new thought, a new way of working. So when you come to looking about how long things last, it doesn't last forever. If you're not sure, only do it for one year. So you start to look about what might have happened, the difference it made, the value it may have, and the length of time. Then look at very simply about what would happen anyway, because certain things will. You know, it would be nice to say that you know, we're all curing world peace or sorting out world peace. We're not. What we're doing is having our own pockets of excellence, our own pockets of value. So we need to consider exactly what's going on. Now, when we work with a lot of um, uh, local governments and the public sector and infrastructure organisations, we encourage people to start, start creating a bank of knowledge. And you can do that by working with your local CBS or local um, social enterprise infrastructure or say local authority to find out what's going on within that particular theme or area or, or demographic which is affecting you. So we all know that there's changes to health and well-being, we all know that there's a bigger focus on getting young people into work. Actually there will be a policy linking locally that is affecting the wider community or the wider uh, county in um, local authority terms. And they will know what they expect to happen. For them, Actually, that's not value. If you're only meeting, for example, a 2.5% on the screen, that's what they expect to, to work, to have. They've already planned for that. So what we need to consider is what you're achieving beyond that. That's where your true value lies. And then we're looking at making it legitimate. So it's about sensitizing the information a bit further. 
So it's understanding what's happening. But this is the biggest part. You will know what's going on in your local community. If you're applying for local funding, you will know what's being affected locally for you. Actually, there are many, many, many sources of information to look about local value and financial value. The simplest ones, which I always say, is the Cabinet Office proxies. And I can send you over a link to this as well. They release a monthly, which has got about 150 costs to certain things happening or not happening. That includes uh, um, police time, antisocial behavior costs. Um, it's got things on employment, um, employability, welfare, into education, the cost of truancy, health and well-being, obviously the cost of a, a, a GP visit or a mental health um, inpatient. They're all there. So actually it's not overly comprehensive, but it's getting there. So it's a good source of income. Bear in mind, if you think about, if you've asked people what their value and it's about reducing crisis care and you ask them either prior to your service starting or afterwards, they tell you that this would have happened or this has happened to them, you can put a cost attached to it. And the Global Value Exchange, which is really, really good, is developing it's about 2,000 examples in different statuses at the moment from outcomes to indicators to impact which will help you. So the things on the value of re reducing smoking, the things on the value of being less socially isolated. So it's the community, social value community, across the world actually, going together to actually impart knowledge. So I really encourage you to sign that up uh, and look at that. Social Return Investment Network, SROI Network, to uh, help develop that. And this is basically how you calculate it. But I'm not going to go through it because it's relatively self-explanatory and it will just kind of stew with your mind. But what I want to show you is the local benefit. And I'm conscious of time and I've got a few minutes left. Is this is the quickest, number one quick win that you've got. You all have accounts in some shape or format. You all know where your um, staff live or volunteers live. You know how much staff are paid. You know where your suppliers are and how much you pay your suppliers. So therefore, we can do some basic local value calculations straight away. So if I know where my staff live and it's in a geographical boundary, i.e., I don't know, um, Greater Manchester, and I know that I employ 55 people, and out of those 45, are uh, local residents within the Manchester area, i.e. the Manchester postcode. And my salary bill for those 45 people is, I don't know, 45,000, uh, £450,000. I know that that money is helping the local economy and therefore the council will, will know that's helping the local economy. What they're not doing is paying money to big, large corporates which will take some of that money out of the area and potentially take it over to London or you know who knows the Cayman Islands. What you also know is you can use a figure of 65% as a guide. New Economics Foundation come up with a figure of 65% of everything that an individual will receive in terms of their net pay would be spent locally. Now it's, it's, a, it's an example as opposed to a concrete rule but it's a good indicator. So if I receive £20,000 my pay packet at, at the end of the year, after I paid all my tax, I know that 65% of that will be spent locally, within the, about a three to four mile radius. That's brilliant because then I know how much is being returned back to the community. If I know my, my supply chain, which ones are from charities, social enterprises, which ones are spent on private businesses, and I know how much I spent on there, you can look and commit to spending your money better locally to the social economy. So, for example, 25% of all the, the money that you spend in your supply chain are to local SMEs or social enterprises. Also, you know what you spend on training and development. 
both formal and informal rates. You know either what you spend on it because obviously you've got to pay it out, or you know how much you would have to spend on training that you may receive for free. Therefore, consider it from mandatory and non-mandatory training. So everyone has to do mandatory training because it's about compliance, safeguarding, health and safety, etc. But if you overtrain people because it's your value, your commitment, your worth and your passion, and as a result of that skill, they're able to do extra, then value it. Define what you're investing in people. Also, the kind of two other things is if you're a social learning minded organization, you've got the ability to create income funding or, or income from outside of the area in which you may operate. For example, Big Lottery. If you're successful in the reaching communities for Big Lottery, you may get, say, half a million pounds. That half a million pounds will be new into the economy. It creates jobs, it creates training, it creates additional service. Unless you celebrate what that looks like and what it's going to achieve, people will not know. So you're stimulating the local economy, positive value. And the final one is, if you know where your staff live, you know where your volunteers live, you know the miles they, that they create, you know how often they go to a location, basically all you've got to do is monitor that, perhaps for a period of just a month, on an average month, you know how many miles they're doing in the local car, because actually they're claiming travel expenses, public transport, and the same with kind of green miles, you can then start to work out your carbon footprint. There's a carbon footprint calculator online, it's free. If you know 20 people work in your office, or 10 people work in your office, three come by um, loan steam and four use the uh, bus and 10 use cars. If you know where they live and you know where you are, you can actually input that information in and it will create your carbon footprint or part of the carbon footprint. So quick wins, measure volunteer contribution. Don't do it on minimum wage, don't do it on mean average. Do it based on the volunteering role they're carrying out. If they are an admin assistant, what would you have to pay an admin assistant in your local area? The same if you're paying for an outreach worker. What would you have to pay an outreach worker per hour and value it accordingly? Measure the positive value in the local community. But well, that is about geographics. So looking about what you're doing locally and breaking it down into local super output areas or local demographics. Measure your supply chain, well that's simple, mentioned that. Measure your value of skills and development, well we measured that as well, highlighted that. And then showcase your profile. Think that some people are going to think with their head, facts and figures, some will be the heart. So think about creating emotionally led stories. So these stories are about putting your passion on paper. Because it's like watching a good film or reading a good book. If it can affect your emotions in some way, you've got a connection. That connection is about um, demonstrating a shared value of a particular area or a particular item. By doing that, what you're going to find is people are more likely to be engaged or supportive. That's the connection that you want to unlock for fundraising and degree of funding. And then finally, is keeping uh, contact. Um, we have to read a hell of a lot, um, as you can probably quite imagine. And we have various things that we send out on newsletters, we have on our website, so it's all free information. And that information enables you to kind of help you along your journey. No one person has the right answer. What I would say is, yes, you can get specialist help. What I would say, however, is be clear on what you need before you consider doing that. Know your audience. You will know your audience better than the person coming in. So start the journey. It, it, it will certainly be a fun one. but make sure before you do anything is contact and engage with your stakeholders, ask them what they value, create your social pledges, create your KVIs, because that will reduce your workload down to try to measure your value by about 75%.
and that's probably the biggest tip I can give you. Hope you found that useful. It's a very quick guide. Obviously, there's so much to cover, um, but hopefully it's useful. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, um, I know, uh, you know, as as always, yeah, uh, the 40, 45 minutes is a is a short time to cover topics like this, but um, but hopefully people will will have got a lot out of that. Um, we did have some sound issues throughout, um, so apologies to everyone for that. Um, I think, I mean, mostly mostly we we could certainly hear you, but there were there were there were some moments when when the sound was dropping off. So, um, so, but hopefully, people people will got the got, got the got the majority of the of the content. And as I said, we have been recording. So, and we'll be sharing. Yes, someone's asking, are we sharing the PowerPoint uh, via email? Yes, we will be. So, we will send everyone the copies of the slides um, together with obviously, you know, Richard's contact details at the end, um, and the recording. If if anyone wants to wants to revisit. Now, we have got a little bit of time. Um, if anyone would like to ask any questions of Richard directly uh, via, the, uh, via the webinar, um, if you do have any, please do just type them in. Uh, type them in through the chat function and I can, I can then read them out. I'll read them out to Richard and he can answer. Um, alternatively, I know there's also a lot to take in there. So if people want to sort of let that uh, process that a little bit, um, and then, then uh, maybe ask questions via Twitter or something directly with Richard. I'm sure that's fine as well. Um, Absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah great. Um, I well, there's a couple of questions are coming through actually. Um, ah, that's this is an interesting from from Michaela. Uh, Richard, in your I guess this is in your opinion. Uh, what are the best cases yeah. of measuring social value? What are the best cases of measuring social value? Um, if I understand that question correctly, it's sort of best case examples of people doing that. Um, but hopefully I'm getting that right. Um, oh, and Michaela has added private sector, preferably. If there, okay. if there are any. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? That's actually really interesting. Um, the private sector is only just... Um, Getting into social value that they, they've used um, CSR, corporate and social responsibility, for many years, and there are some great examples of private sector stuff which I can send out to that. Um, but it's generally more linking into the traditional aspects in terms of um, engaging with young people for apprenticeships and also environmental impact. Okay. Um, it's just starting to be modernised, um, and that's linking into legislation where CSR will become mandatory for anybody bidding for EU-based work. So I don't have a one off the top of my head, I'll be honest, uh, but I can send some examples and some highlights over. Um, but it, it's not as good as you would expect it to be. Okay, thank you. I mean, if you can think of any examples, then yeah, just send if you email me, and then I can put them through to everyone. Yeah. Um, another question um, about the costs involved in mm -hmm. in in measurement. Do you have a ballpark percentage or an amount of cost that a startup should allocate for measurement and reporting of social value? So quite quite a relevant question, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. It does depend on complexity, I have to say. Um, but if you were to look at it as a proper startup, so literally, you know, you, you've just got your incorporation documents and just about set out. What I would suggest is cost is actually relatively low um, because what you'll be looking at when you first start out, it'll be forecasting your value. This is all about best guess based on uh, information and research. So if you were to require somebody externally to come in, um, an external person could give you a really good steer 
and help you within a, about three about three days worth of time. So depending on if that was a consultant, anywhere from two fifty a day up to six hundred pound a day would be the the general charge in in the support sector. Um, that would give you enough of a, a benchmark um, to be developed. So the key questions. Um, stakeholder mapping and some direction on KVIs in that world. One day to support people to uh, articulate the information. So if the organization was to go out and speak to stakeholders, how was that transferred into outcomes, impact and value? And then perhaps a day to then align um, some of the financial values to some of the assumptions that have been made. So three days would be the minimum, I would say, but it can be as big as you want. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just see. I think we might have one more question. Oh, actually, we've got two more. Let's let's pick the social value quality mark one. Um, uh, uh, Someone was just asking if you if if you if you mentioned what the what the social value quality mark was, um, they uh, they weren't sure if uh, they picked I, that I, up I, in your webinar. Yeah, no, I didn't mention it. it it's something that can happen, and um, oh, hello, hello, hello. Yeah, oh, we can. My, my, my screen's gone blank. Uh, oh, we can hear you. That's the main thing. <laughs> That's the main thing. Oh, I might have spoken too soon. I might have spoken too soon. Um, it looks like we may have lost Richard. Uh, in which case, we will we will draw the webinar to a close. I noticed there's at least one more question that you'd asked, so I will make sure he gets that and that he can get back to. Um, we'll get back to you directly. And um, thank you so much for participating, and thanks again for bearing bearing with us um, with with the sound and um, and we'll we'll follow up with the with the PowerPoint slides and also details of all the future webinars so wish you all a great rest of the day um, and and thanks again for joining us thanks <laughs>